Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Nanam Paramam Dheyam Knowledge is Supreme Hello students, the topic of this uh, last uh, this portion, this presentation is numerator dynamics. So at the end of this uh, lecture, uh, you would be able to compute poles and zeros of any transfer function. Uh, you would be able to state the importance of uh, numerator dynamics uh, which is a part of this lecture and uh, you uh, will finish. Uh, by giving you some guidelines about uh, how do you predict a step response of any transfer function uh, by computing its poles and zeros. This will be very useful for us going forward when we move to the next module of this process uh, where we talk about process control. So we will finish uh, the process dynamics portion by giving you the tools which are required uh, to predict response of any general transfer function. So let us uh, get started. So, so far uh, we have looked at different examples uh, of uh, dynamical systems. We started with the first order processes, second order processes and then uh, we extended it up to higher order processes. In all those examples uh, what we considered was all the effect that was coming was from the denominator. So whatever transfer function we had considered it had some constant in the numerator and some polynomial in S in the denominator. But uh, there are some examples of systems and especially those are the case, most of those cases come when we have a controller which is combined with the system. Uh, the numerator need not be independent of S. So a general transfer function will be of the form Ns over Ds where ns and ds are polynomials in s. So in this lecture uh, we will see what effect does this ns have on the dynamics of this particular system uh, when uh, it is a function of s. Uh, so if you recall uh, uh, one example uh, that was the example uh, when we get a second order system uh, by uh, by virtue of having an integral controller on a first order process. In that case uh, the transfer function which we had gotten for first order process plus integral controller, the transfer function in that case had S in the numerator and the denominator was the second order transfer function and the numerator there was S. So this S is going to have a specific effect on this response of this transfer function which will make it different from how a general Kp over tau square S square plus twice zeta tau S plus 1. This response is much different than when you have S in the numerator. So that is exactly what we will be studying in this particular lecture that what happens when we have NS uh, which is a function of S. So in order to analyze these kind of systems uh, we define two terms for a transfer function. So we will write a transfer function as a polynomial representation ratio of two polynomials NS over DS. So we define poles as roots of the equation ds equal to 0. So you take the denominator polynomial and uh, you equate it to 0, the roots of that give you poles. So those are known as poles of the transfer function and the poles give the dynamic modes of the process. So 
so by dynamic modes uh, what i mean is it tells you whether the system is fast or slow would there be oscillations so all those uh, Uh, dynamic modes which are possible for a system those would be given by roots of this polynomial ds and when we have the numerator polynomial as well then what we get is zeros so those are the roots of the numerator polynomial so when you take ns and equate it to zero the roots of that are going to give you what are known as zeros of the transfer function and uh, poles give you dynamic modes zeros give you relative contribution of these dynamic modes so essentially it will just tell you which of these dynamic modes are dominant are they moving all the dynamic modes have same contribution to output or some of them have opposing contribution so all that effect will be com compressed inside these zeros and for any typical uh, transfer function for a well what we call as well posed transfer function which is also like any real transfer function practically implemented transfer function what you should have is the numerator degree so the degree of the numerator polynomial should be less than equal to the degree of the denominator polynomial so that will make it physically realizable if the numerator degree is greater than the denominator uh, we will see that those processes are not physically uh, realizable so let us try to see the effect uh, of this uh, by using a simple example so we'll take a second order process with first order numerator dynamics so we'll take a general form as tau n s plus 1 as the numerator and in the denominator we'll consider two first order series combination and then depending on the value of tau n uh, we'll have different types of numerator dynamics for this particular process so we'll start uh, with a case and we'll look at step response of this particular system uh, let us say when we have tau n is equal to 0 so when tau n is equal to 0 uh, the transfer function is 1 over 2s plus 1 5s plus 1 so there are no numerator dynamics to speak of and the response is over damped so the response will be something like this the gain is 1 so the final value if the step response or the step change was unity uh, what you would get is the final value is 1 so that is uh, what will happen when there is no numerator dynamics now uh, let us consider uh, that uh, tau n is equal to 2 so when tau n is equal to 2 uh, we are going to have 2n plus 1 and 2n plus 1 so these two modes would get cancelled and what you have is 1 over 5s plus 1 so in fact uh, this system is going to behave like a first order system with time constant of 5 so in that case uh, the response uh, you can see that the response will be something like this this is when tau n is equal to 2 so you can see uh, the stark difference between Uh, the original response and this response is that uh, the when there was no numerator dynamics the system was idle for quite some time so the response was sigmoidal which is a characteristic of any higher order overdamped system but as soon as you have some numerator dynamics the initial slope is non zero and the system reacts to the step change immediately same thing will be true when i take uh, tau n is equal to 5 in that case it will be 5s plus 
over 2s plus 1, 5s plus 1. So, these two terms will get cancelled and the response will be 1 over 2s plus 1 which is significantly faster than this. So, in that case the response will be like this, this is when tau n is equal to 5. So, these are uh, very simpler cases to analyze. Now, the interesting thing will happen when we keep on increasing tau n beyond this 5. So, let us say or before that uh, let me just uh, redraw some of the responses. Uh, when this tau n uh, was let us say greater than 0 but between 2, the response would be something like this, it will be faster than tau n equal to 0 but slower than this. So, this is when tau n is equal to 1, when tau n is equal to 3 or 4, the response will be like this. So, what you can see is as my tau n is increasing from 0, the response is moving in this particular direction. So, what happens if I increase tau n beyond 5? So, the response what is going to it is going to push the response in this direction and the response looks like this. So, you can see that the response is exceeding the ultimate value, there are no oscillations, but the response is exceeding the ultimate value because both the dynamic modes are contributing more than the ultimate value or more than the constant uh, term inside the response and what you get is overshoot. This is for tau n let us say equal to 6 which is greater than 5. So, what we are having is uh, without oscillations or an overdamped system is giving you overshoot that is possible only when you have numerator dynamics. The other case would be what if we move in the other direction. So, instead of moving in this direction we start moving in the other direction and try to reduce tau n below 0. So, let us say if tau n is negative then the response is going to move in this direction. It has already reached a value where it is almost flat parallel flat on the x axis. If you increase tau n or de decrease tau n further the response is actually going to go in the opposite direction and then reach the final value. So, what you are seeing is initially the response is actually going in the opposite direction. So, this type of response you can get when tau n is equal to minus 1 and this response is known as inverse response. The reason it is called as inverse response is because uh, the final gain between input and output is positive. So, when my input changes by one unit, the output is also going to change by one unit. But initially if you look, the change in the input or increase in the input is causing a decrease in the output. So, initial response is exactly opposite to what the final response looks like and there is a crossing of the response y equal to 0. So, this kind of inverse response happens when we also due to numerical dynamics when tau n is negative in this case. So, by just changing what is the numerator and which is going to change the 0 of the system, the pole of the system, poles of this system remain constant, you can have wide variety of dynamics simply based on the combination of efforts of these two poles. So, by having the contribution change between these dynamic modes, you can have overshoot and you can also have inverse response. So, all that is the product of this numerator tau transfer function which is tau n s plus 1. So, by just changing the numerator dynamics you can have wide variety of uh, possibilities uh, the system can exhibit. We can take another example this time the first order numerator and first order denominator. And again uh, we can try to find out the response when tau n is equal to 0 
uh, we will have 1 over 5s plus 1. So, the response stays at 0 and then goes to 1 as a first order response. So, this is when tau n is equal to 0. Now, if we increase tau n beyond this value, uh, what you would see is in that case, uh, the response does not start at 0. Uh, so, up to time t equal to 0 response is 0 and suddenly the response starts at some value non 0 and then goes to this final value as a first order response. So, let us say this is tau n is equal to 1. So, there is a discontinuity at t equal to 0. You can find this initial value by using initial value theorem. So, this discontinuity uh, will keep on increasing as you increase tau n. When tau n is equal to 5, what you are going to get is 5 s plus 1 over 5 s plus 1. So, the transfer function becomes unity that means it is an instantaneous process uh, with gain 1. So, it the input and output are exactly identical. So, input was a step. So, output will also be a step. So, what you will get is a discontinuity of value 1. So, output will also be a step unit step response or unit step. When so, we have been increasing tau n and the response is moving in this direction as tau n goes beyond 5 in that case what you would see is uh, the response will start at high value higher than 1 and it will go down to 1. So, again uh, what you are going to have is an overshoot when tau n is greater than 5. And similarly uh, by the extension of like the previous example if we move in the opposite direction and tau n is negative, uh, the value will actually start below 0 and then it will go up to the value of 1. So, you will have when tau n is less than 0, you will have inverse response. So, again uh, having the same dynamic mode which is uh, 5s plus 1 over 5s plus 1 by changing the numerator transfer function, you get overshoot some discontinuity in the input uh, at time t equal to 0 and then the inverse response as well. Now, this type of transfer function is also known as a lead lag type of transfer function. Because the degree of numerator is equal to the degree of denominator. So, denominator is a first order lag and numerator is a first order lead. So, this type of transfer function is known as a lead lag uh, type of system. Uh, when we analyze control systems, uh, we will see that some of the transfer functions which we get, uh, which will be of this form. So, depending on the value of tau n, we may have some kind of overshoot or inverse response. So, we have seen that uh, by having something, some polynomial in the numerator, uh, we can get a uh, different types of dynamics uh, which were not possible uh, when we had a constant in the numerator. Specifically, we can get overshoot uh, even for non-oscillatory behavior and we can get something which is known as inverse response which is one of the difficult or the most difficult uh, type of dynamics uh, to control in any chemical processes. So, we will try to analyze this inverse response a little bit further about uh, why it happens or how it happens. So, inverse response uh, is a type of response when the initial direction of output is different than the final direction of output change. So, initially the output goes in the negative direction, but the final gain or the final direction is positive. So, having such kind of a response is known as an inverse response 
when the system initially shows exactly opposite direction of movement as compared to the final direction of movement which is an increase uh, in the output but initially you can see that there was a decrease in the output. Now these type of processes are extremely difficult to control. Because uh, what is going to happen is uh, as soon as the controller makes a move, so let us say in this case the controller has to move the output from this point to this point and this will happen if he makes a positive move or positive step change in the input. So now what is going to happen is whenever the controller makes a positive step in the input, the initially the output is going to deviate or show. So initially output is going to move in the opposite direction. So the controller is going to think that it has made an exactly wrong move or exactly opposite move. So the controller is going to make a reverse move in that case which uh, is wrong because uh, for this particular system the correct input is an increase in the input but if the controller makes a opposite move it is not going to be able to get this particular type of response. The response it is going to lead the system to is the mirror image of this and the system will never be able to reach this particular point. It will go in the opposite direction. So what happens is every time the system, uh, the controller will try to make an exactly opposite move and the system will either end up at this point or it will keep on oscillating between the operating points and the system will never be able to reach this particular final output point. Because of that the inverse responses are very difficult to control and uh, we should know when we can, uh, when we get inverse responses. It is always better to know that uh, the system exhibits inverse response then some corrective action can be taken or has to be taken in order to control that process. So let us uh, look uh, more into when do we get inverse response. That is what is the physics of the process. What is the physics of the process which will give you inverse response. So as it turns out inverse responses happen uh, because there are two competing effects which are triggered by the input. So if this is my input, when I change my input, it is going to change the output in two ways. So there are two parallel processes which take place and a net output is the combination of the two. So there are two parallel processes which are taking place and as it turns out uh, they have to follow certain rules then only you will get inverse response. So let us say G1 is which has positive gain. So this Y1 increases when U increases but it is slower. As against G2 which has negative gain. So that means when u increases y2 in fact decreases but it is a faster response. So you need to have two transfer functions between the input and output which are in parallel with each other. The one effect has a positive gain and slower and the other has negative gain and faster. The same thing this can also be negative in that case this has to be positive. So the idea is there are two parallel processes which are operating at different time scales and the gains are opposite to each other. The gain being opposite is very essential and they also have different time scales. So when you have that under certain conditions or values of these 
different gains as well as time constants you will get the inverse response and mathematically you can find that out so any physical system which is going to give you inverse response is going to have these uh, kind of parallel processes which are happening so if i want to give you some literature examples uh, the very commonly common system which gives inverse response is boiler or drum boiler level as a response to change in cold feed water so if you have a boiler this is the outlet for steam and typically you want to control this level by changing the feed water so as it turns out when you increase the feed water uh, flow rate um, ideally what you expect is that the level should increase because you are adding more material into the process however uh, what happens is uh, whenever you have such kind of a system uh, when you are boiling this liquid there will also be some bubbles of this steam which are inside the liquid and the height is actually the addition of actual liquid height plus the rise in the height because of these bubbles when you add cold feed water in then the volume of these droplets go down and as the volume of these droplets go down the actual level goes down so the response of the level uh, looks something like this as a response to step change in the input and you get inverse response this is a very commonly studied process uh, where you get inverse response the other system which can give you inverse response is the reboiler part level or even composition in distillation column as a response to reboiler duty so what happens is uh, let us say if you take the bottom of the distillation column let us say this is the nth tray and then this is your reboiler where you provide heat what is going to happen is when you increase uh, the reboiler duty uh, the amount of vapor which goes up into the column increases and uh, as this vapor increases it causes uh, puts a force on this liquid which is on nh tray and it pushes more liquid down so the amount of vapor increase uh, in this case uh, is countered by more liquid which falls down and even though we are boiling more liquid inside this reboiler the net hold up of the reboiler momentarily increases so even though you increase the reboiler duty uh, the level inside the reboiler keeps on increases momentarily before it starts to reduce and same with the composition uh, as you are mixing some low composition liquid into the reboiler because of this effect the purity also goes down so ideally what you expect uh, is uh, when the reboiler duty increases the reboiler level you want to go down but initially you see that the level increases and then the level goes down and the opposite effect is on the composition so if you look at the composition of less volatile as you increase the reboiler duty you want it to be purer but what you see is uh, initially the purity goes down that is because of the mixing of this low quality liquid into the reboiler and then eventually it goes to a higher value so in both these cases you get inverse response so uh, we'll try to we'll stop here uh, for this lecture thank you